Coco. So we like to start with the opening tip. Um, we just talked about a little bit off air here before show, but you're head coach of two separate programs. So time is at a premium for you, right? Like this might be your uh, spring might be a little, little bit of uh, recuperate and then you got to get right back at it. Right. Cause you got summer basketball, summer, summer football, all of that. Um, how do you, how do you balance it out? Okay. How, first of all, and then how do you give, delegate your responsibilities to others to not get overwhelmed or, you know, cause it's, I, I look at it as one of those things where you try to do everything and you don't do anything well. Right. So try to be the best you can for your players um, using your assistance and balancing the whole thing with two programs. I mean, well, it works out. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, it is difficult. Don't get me wrong. It is very difficult, especially when you're coaching two varsity sports. And uh, I mean, we all know in the Western house, we could meet, we compete in the Chicago public league. So in uh, our, our teams, both football and girls basketball compete at the, what would be called the premier conferences in the public league, the red Northwest for the girls and uh, Illini, uh, Red and Illini Northwest for the boys' football program. So I have great assistance, first off. I will say that it's a team effort. You know, in football, I have a great group of guys that work with me, and they help me a lot. You know, some of those guys even sometimes tell me, hey, coach, go home. We got it. You know, take a break or whatever, you know. So it all works with just having a great group of assistants. I mean, having great kids, too. You know, I have a lot of great kids within both programs, and then, you know, they support. You know, we're all one family, so we all support one another in the off season. you know. Like right now, we just in the basketball. Like I said, I'm taking a few weeks off. You know, I, I tend to help with track in there because most of my athletes do participate in track in the off season. So I want to make sure I support those guys. If they're not running track, we have them in the weight room. So you know, I have a good group of assistants that you know runs those programs, and I just kind of just show my face and just let the kids know I'm still here for them and try to get stuff together for the summer. Whether it's you know putting together our summer schedule for football and putting together our schedule for different open gyms. And different stuff we'll participate in the summer for basketball. Well, let's expand on that a little bit then, coach. Like when I you know, now you got a little bit of time, right? You you got that lead up. But when you go from football to basketball, a lot of times those those come those are overlapping and you're trying to do two th two things at two things at once. It, 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 you know what? It actually is a killer with that because like, you know, for the last two years our football team has been very successful. You know, we made right. city and state playoffs. So, you know, it, it, it's accredited to uh, my assistant here, coach of girls basketball, Robert Davis. He does a good job. He actually, he also coaches football with me too. But, you know, towards the end of that, you know, for, you know, towards that week eight, week nine season, we start transitioning him into the gym to get ready for basketball season. So he actually does a good job. Him and my other assistants, you know, they do a great job of handling that while I still finish up football. You know, for example, this year we played football all the way to, you know, two, you know, we were two weeks into the basketball season, and I still was coaching football. So, like I say, my sisters, Robert Davis, Terrell Scott, you know, Andy Tonight, Dorian Reese, Latanya Shaw, they did a great job of maintaining my vision, what I want and what we want within the program while I'm still finishing up football. And like I say, it, it, it's a credit to the kids, too, because the kids, they understand that, hey, hey, coach, it's, it's, we still got to do things if this Coach Carter was here. If coach, they called me JC. If Coach JC was still here. We don't miss a beat. You know, we got to get things rolling. Well, I, I think that's a testament to you, Coach. I think one of those famous sayings yeah. is, uh, you know, if the standards are real if they're still held when you're not there. So I think that's definitely a testament to you as well. Um, you know, we Todd and I were fascinated. We really want to dig in a little bit on, you know, uh, just the, the, the comparisons of football and basketball a little bit. And so we wanted to start with the skills of a great point guard versus a great quarterback. And <laughs> You know, what kind of what are the similarities that you, you may look for in your point guard and you may look for in your quarterback? And, um, you know, how can each of them kind of be developed maybe in a similar way as, as leaders, as as the person that's got the, the rock in their hand at all times? I mean, believe it or not, they're very similar to me because in basketball, a point guard for me is the floor, the floor general, the person that's in charge. You know, I depend on her to just, you know, run the show, run the offense. Everything goes through her. You know, she's got to be that coach on the floor. She's got to, you know, she might see something from a different angle that I don't see right away. Or she might see the, hey, coach, I think we could take this guard off the wing right away. You know, let me run this, you know. So, I mean, they got to be, the, you know, you got to be that floor general. You got to be that leader on the floor. You know, in football, I mean, the quarterback is the quarterback. I mean, 
my and it's crazy because I happen to have two great kids at those positions right now. You know, my quarterback at Ski Bully was a uh, all state as a junior. He threw for over 2,000 yards and rushed for over 800 yards. So it was tremendous to have his leadership on the field. And, you know, we the type the style of offense we run, and he was he was great at it. You know, he saw stuff that we didn't see sometimes. So it helped us a lot as coaches to make different calls. And on basketball, I mean, Jamila Jackson, is she's probably one of the best sophomores in the state. She's already surpassed 1,000 points. You know, she's learning every, every, every game. She got better this year. You know, we're learning how to distribute the ball better, learning when to shoot, when not to shoot. And of course, she's still a little young, so sometimes she'll take those shots when you don't want her to. But you know, who doesn't? <laughs> no doubt, no, no doubt. So I wanted to talk about uh, establishing a, a culture, but in two very different types of settings and sports, right? Football and basketball. There's there's some similarities, but you know, it's it's also very different. So, you know, how do you go about? establishing those things in both both programs um obviously you have your core values and things that probably stay the same but when it you know when it comes to football and, and basketball uh, and two men and women right it's two different two different uh things what are the similarities and what are the differences i mean the similarities that with but they both my programs me and my coaches try to do a, do our best to try to install mental toughness in the kids you know we got to mentally be tough i mean especially you know playing in the Chicago Public League. Uh, you know, we had a college prep school. So mental toughness is key for both sports for us. We got to be able to fight through that adversity. I mean, sometimes the ref is not going to always give you the call that you think you should have got in basketball. You might have thought you were fouled. You're not going to get that every time. In football, you might have thought, hey, that's a questionable call. It should have been a hold. It should have been this. So you got to, you know, kids got to be able to fight through that mental toughness. That's one of the similarities I would say that we do try to teach. You know, and the, bad, the differences, I would say, I mean, for me, it's kind of hard because I like for my kids to be tough and just, you know, you know, I like how to, you know, I say killer instinct, you know what I mean? Be able to just, you know, you got to want it, the will to want it. So, but if I had to pick one difference, it would be like, you know, with football, we got to set the tone right away. Like, I, you know, that first hit, you got to set the tone. You know, that first play from scrimmage, whether it's a kickoff or whatever, we got to set the tone right away. And basketball, sometimes, you know, you want to get a feel because you might have saw some on film, but they come out totally different and show you something totally different. So you have to make that adjustment right away. In football, when you make a both games are a game of adjustments, but basketball that adjustment could come quicker than you know quicker than football. You might have to you know I've been in games where I call timeouts thirty seconds into the game because I just didn't like what we were doing. I've seen you them make do that. Adjustment right away. What you say? I said I've seen you do that. Right. I mean, it's, we're twenty seconds into the game. Oh no, that's not what we saw. Hold on. Let's fix this right now before it gets out of hand. That's, you know, that's football, what they kind of football. You might be able to get away. Hey, let's see what this first drive. Let's see how we finish this first drive. Even if it ends in a punt, five, six plays down the line. But you know, you can make that adjustment going into the second drive. Basketball, you look up, you down five possessions, six possessions, and that can get out of hand right away. Kids know they're in trouble when you call a timeout thirty seconds in, right? <laughs> they're like, "Oh, I'm sure coach, we all have done that." I mean, yeah, absolutely. I have too. Absolutely. Coach, coach, not happy. Oh boy, we better get it together. Well, that that is an interesting point, coach. And I think uh, just to expand on that, you know, football, uh, you know, it's it's kind of broken up, as you said, in, into those separate drives, right? You can go three and out. Your defense go back on the floor or on the on the field, and and then your offense can go back on the floor after you know your coaches have broken it down. You know, basketball wise, you know, you're having a possession, then there all of a sudden there's a defensive possession, then all of a sudden there's an offensive possession. There's really no breakdown time for yeah. that. So and yep. how how do you utilize, you know, maybe your assistance more in basketball per se, when you kind of take the kid out to kind of talk to the kid? You kind of talked about your great assistant. So how do you utilize them during a game when you take a kid out to kind of have them break it down for the kid while you're still coaching the game. So, uh, for example, in basketball, it works great because, like, uh, you've seen me coach before. You saw my team play the last yep. couple of years. Yep. In basketball, believe it or not, I, I handle the subs, but sometimes, I you know, I let my sisters handle those subs. Because, like I say, I might be focused on one thing, whatever defense we in, whatever set. My sisters might see something I don't see before me. So, a lot of my sisters handle my subs for me, you know. And they, you know, we have to get that kid out and, you know, correct her and tell her what we wanted to do. You know, whether it's, hey, you're too low, you're too high. Hey, you got to, you crossed your feet on that one. So, I mean, having those assistants on the bench, you know, 
it helps me a whole lot, you know, because even if we sub two or three girls out, I got those two, three quality assistants that everybody can get with that individual player and kind of explain, hey, Coach JC looking for this. This is what we was looking for. You didn't do this. We put you back in there. We need you to maintain. We need you to hold down the board, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it may be at that particular time. So we, we kind of want to stay on this theme of, of kind of going back and forth between the two sports, but let, let's really talk about watching film and, you know, just the different things that you look for when you're watching film in both sports, you know, you kind of just alluded to a little bit of the, the preparation. So what are things you're looking for in scouting an opponent in maybe each specific sport? And then if you compare the sports, is there anything that you and your assistants watch on film in, in both sports that you're both you're looking for when you're scouting an opponent in both sports? So uh, yeah, I can so uh I'm gonna go right into when we watch film for both sports. What we look for, the first thing we try to look for is the team physical or not. Are they a finesse team? Are they physical? You know, because even with football, you get a lot of finesse teams, you know, they run the spread offenses nowadays. We're just trying to hey. We're quick hitters. We're trying to get the ball out to the playmaker's hands on the edge, and we're trying to take off. Or they're going to come and hit us right in the mouth, ground a pound. So we try to look at the physicality of a team. Basketball, the same way. You get some teams, they come out, they might run a simple five out, you know, eight to ten passes, just trying to slow, you know, if you're in zone, just trying to, you know, find a gap, to attack the gap of the zone. Or they might just come out, hey, we're going to open it up. They got one of the best players, and they're going to go right and rip your heart out right now. You know what I mean? So that's what I really look for, just – Hey, is this team going to be physical? And do we need to be physical right out the gate? Or do we or we have time to, to see what they give us to make those adjustments? I mean, I think that would be similar in both sports. And as far as the differences is, I mean, like I say, with football, I mean, we're, we're, we try to be as aggressive as possible, as aggressive as possible. When we watch a film, we try to find out where are they weak at. Offensively, okay, they have a great front seven, but I think on the, on the outside of the corners and the DBs, we think we could attack this kid right away. You know, we happen to have a good group of receivers last year. We have a good group coming back this year. They all ran track for it. They all went down state to compete the track. So we think we have some, we think we have something to work with on the outside. So when we watch film and football, me and the coach, if we notice that there's that one person we think we could attack right away, we're going to attack them right away. We want that coach to take a timeout. We want to see if we can make them take a timeout in that first drive to make an adjustment. You know, in basketball, we just want to see what they're going to give us. Because, you know, we have, like I say, we have one of the best players in the state, Jamal Jackson. We want to see if teams are going to play us in man. If they play us in man, we're going to, you know, I think my I think my guard is better than your guard. I'm going to give it a green light to try to go get a bucket right away. But if you come out of zone, okay, now, what's up? whether we pull it out, we want to run a five out or some type of motion set, it really depends on, that's what we look for on film. Because we play several teams this year in basketball. You know, we have great teams we play in the Red Northwest. Lane, Amundsen, you know, Jones, Whitney Young, who was probably one of the best, teams in the state the last 10 years, 20, you know, they're dominant. So, I mean, you know, we see those teams play each other. They might play man against the whole game. But versus us, we, we get in the zone all of a sudden. So it's like we got to make that adjustment on the fly. So in practice, we have to coach them up to be prepared for both sets. You know, hey, they might give you this one, two, two. They might give you this three. You know, be prepared for whatever. Um, I wanted to follow up on that. Then how, like, you know, on basketball, obviously you can look for, for tendencies individually, right? I think football, you can maybe get more out of formations, how they line up, right? If you have Actually, enough. Actually, a lot of the keys, man. Yeah, yeah enough, enough film on them. So so how do you use, how do you help your players kind of recognize those tendencies and use those tendencies to advantage? Because I, I think sometimes that could be, you know, more important than, then okay, they're gonna run this, this, and this exactly. If you kind of know the basketball say girl likes to go right all the time, if you can force them left, and let's be honest, most teams probably enter right for the most part, right? If you do the math, do the mm -hmm. study on it, you know, if you can disrupt that tendency or in football, you can help your players. Um, okay, they're in this formation based on what we've seen we're going to make this adjustment to this call, right, for coverage or whatever it may be. So how do you help your, your players kind of recognize those tendencies? And so, I mean, I'm sure a coach could attest to this. In basketball, you know, especially at the girls' level, I mean, like I said, we play in the Chicago Public League, Red Northwest, very competitive between us and the Red, the Red South. Those are probably two of the – you compete with the top teams in the city, no the doubt. top 16 no teams doubt. in the city. So, but most of the time, when you get girls basketball, I don't know how you feel about this, Coach, but – you're technically going to have a team with girls that's going to have maybe one or two ball handles. If you're lucky to get one of those teams that have, you know, multiple ball handles, that's a plus. 
So that's the first thing we look at. Hey, this is the only person that could dribble the ball. This, these two right here. Let's try to focus on stopping these two. Now we got to make everybody else do so. You know, that's how we look at them in basketball. And I'm sure teams look the same way. Hey, watch number 22 and number five. Those are the ones he want bringing the ball up. Let's try to deny them early and make somebody else get in the mix. You know, right. in football, it's pretty much the same way. I mean, in football, you know, it's, it's a little different. But in football, when you played West House this year in football, you knew that everything offensively went through a ski board. You knew that. You knew he's the general. He's the, he's the show. He's the showrunner, you know. But what you didn't know is that, you know, Ski is a very smart kid. I mean, he's a 5.0 kid out of college prep school. So he has a great job. You know, he studies defense. He's got to read what you're going to give him. So he did, a, he did a great job of delegating getting the ball in the right playmaker's hands at the right time for us. All right. I want to go into a segment called halftime adjustments. I'm going to go a two-parter here. Um, one, we're going to start with basketball. John and I talked about this. Lately. This is going to go, go away because shot clock is coming, right? But – you know, you saw at times, even in the state tournament, some teams, hey, we're just going to hold it out here and right <laughs> and go. So, you know, obviously you have to be careful, right? If they, like you said, you got a guard. If you're going to, they're going to go out and guard you right around them. But so how do you make adjustments to a team like that and still, you know, maintain your competitiveness, right? Like, you know, teams are doing it in basketball because they know, okay, I got a better person than you. If you, if you come guard us, we're probably going to go around you and score, right? Um, so that's that's the first one. Let's talk about, like, the, the the pulling it out and stalling aspect. How do you counter that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've been burnt by it before, and I've been successful with it. I think it really just depends on the, the floor of the game, the situation of the game. I mean, we, have, I mean, I'm sure I've been in games before where I'm down 15 at three minutes, and – the team doesn't stall it out that we come back and win. And I've been in games where I've been up by 15 or 16 with three minutes left, and I didn't stall it out, and I lose. So, I mean, I really just think it's the, the general floor of the game, and I'm going to be real with you. It, it depends on what kids show up for you that day. I've been, you know, this team I had this year was very young. We, you know, we ended up finishing the season, you know, a lot stronger than we started the season. We started the season three and seven. And, I, I mean, I don't have any hair to pull out, but we struggled. To, you know, to find our identity early because of our youth, you know, lack of leadership. But, you know, we had a team meet right before Christmas and we got it together and we finished the season very strong. We were able to, you know, three teams that beat us early in the season, we ran into them in shootouts in the playoffs and we were able to, you know, beat them handily. So, I mean, I just think it was a testament to the girls finally just, hey, let's calm down, let's buy into it, let's stop playing more together, you know, and it worked for us. But, as far as stalling out, I mean, it, for me, it really depends on the situation. Because, I mean, in our regional championship game, we were up seven with two minutes left, and I stalled it out. You know, we went four corners. We stalled it out. We went to the free throw line. We didn't shoot the ball from the free throw line very well this year as a team. And we ended up winning by 14, but we still shot probably seven for 14 at the end of the game to close it out. So that could have hurt me in the long run, of, you know. But unfortunately, you know, Northside was missing free throws too. <laughs> All right, the, then let's flip it to the football side. Uh, and you talked about teams that run spread and speed it up and then teams that want to pound you, right? So I guess more week to week, um, you know, that could be a big adjustment, right? You could go somebody who's going to go super fast, just go, go, go. So, you know, now you're talking about your communication and your coverages with, with your players and you got to get them in quick. Or, you know, now you flip to the next week and you got a team that's going to, be real physical and get after you. So how do you help your players kind of adjust back and forth in those situations? I mean, we, I mean, we, we, we try to do as much as possible with them over the summer with those 25 days we get. So we try to take advantage of those days a lot in the summer. You know, we go to different 707 tournaments, try to do different linemen challenges to prepare our kids mentally for what we're going to go through. Cause I mean, football, we compete in that red Northwest. So it's like, that's like the elite of the public league. You know, you have four, con well, it's just switched now. You have four conferences, but, we're one of those top 16 teams, so there is no weeks off. So the kids mentally have to be prepared to compete every week. There's no, oh, man, going into week four, I think we can rest. We can rest, you know, Timothy, you know, we should be okay. No, it's not, it's not like that in the conference we play in in the public league. So as far as it goes, I mean, the kids just have to – we have to do it. We do a good job of mentally preparing the kids what to expect, you know. Like, for example, this year, uh, we played Whitney Young. Whitney Young is more of a pro-style West Coast offense. You know, similar to us in size, 
You know, but going into the next week, play Lane Tech. We're talking about 300 pounds across the board on the O-line. Wing T, we letting you know we running it down your throat. We letting you know we're going to hit it in your mouth. So we went from playing uh, our regular, you know, defense cover three, you know, cover two look to, hey, we got to put eight men in the box. We got to sometimes put nine men in the box and just play cover zero on the outside because we know they're going to run it down our throat. So, I mean, I think that just took mental toughness and our kids bought into that. Because, I mean, once we get that schedule and we know who we're playing week, week, what day, we mentally prepare the kids through the summer. Hey, going into week seven, you're going to have to be prepared to handle this, you know. We use it as a coach point of practice, you know. We feel like someone's not been physical enough. Hey, I hope you got this together by week nine, week week six when we play Lion Tech. Because they're going to run it right down our throat. So you got to be ready for this. Just as a note for our listeners before we move on, because I know Coach keeps referencing his conference, you know, just for our listeners that don't know, the, the Chicago Public League Red and, and the Red uh, the Red Northwest in girls basketball and the and the Red North, I, I believe you're in the Red North for, for football, correct? Yes, the Red North, yeah. You know, just for our listeners, you know, the coach is going against schools that are three, four, oh. 5,000 kids, uh, very large schools throughout the city. Some teams that have been downstate for football, some teams that have been downstate for basketball. So um, when he references, he, he's referencing some of the best teams in the city. I just, I just wanted to put that out there for you, coach. Um, oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Something I did want to bring up is you brought up in your last answer, establishing an identity for your, for your kids. I wanted to hit on that a little bit. How do you, do you know in the summer what your team's identity is? Do you let your kids kind of define it? Does their play kind of define it? Or do you, how do you go about establishing that identity? I mean, we, we, through the, for football, we go through the summer, you know, we try to stop like, Hey, like, I'm not gonna lie. Last year, we, last year, I've been at West House six years now. Last year, I knew it was going to be something special about the team because they just, the brotherhood they had, you know, when we went places, you could just tell the smiles on their faces, like, they were together. They, they were in sync. So I knew this team. I just knew that team would be the type of team where they would just be like, hey, I got your back no mother, no matter what. You know, even playing with, you know, we had a game last year. We were down, we were down 13 to nothing going into the fourth quarter with six minutes left. But no one on the side, like even if someone thought, hey, it's over, that they was, you know, upset. You know how kids are teenagers, you know, they get emotional, they get down on themselves. It was players on that sideline for football, you know, you know, that got hey, hey man, this is a lot of football left. You know, this game's not over. I don't see zeros on the clock. Let's fight through. Let's get a stop. Let's get a score. And now we back in this game. And it worked out in our favor, and we won that game. And that's just a testament to, like I say, my biggest thing is I just want my kids to try to be mentally tough because not only are they going to fight through the adversity of playing a high school sport, but just in life in general. My goal is to try to prepare my kids for their next coach. So when I say that, I mean I want my kids to go to the next level to play a sport. I'm preparing you for your next coach. And then your next coach should be preparing you for what life is going to give you. Someday you're going to be mothers. Someday you're going to be fathers. Someday you're going to have to get a job. You know, you're going to have to take care of somebody. So I want you to be mentally tough to handle all that adversity. And I'm just a step that's going to help you get there, you know. So I think that leads perfectly into the, the second half of the episode and, and our first question, which is just talking about the off season. I know you've talked about the things you do require, but, you know, <laughs> in all honesty, coach, I also know that you coach in the city and players have a lot to balance. There's a lot of other commitments and work and family and, and things that they have to balance. So, you know, for you, for your Westinghouse programs, whether it's football or girls basketball, how do you help players kind of balance those commitments and, but also have standards and requirements, um, you know, during the off season? Uh, so for football, for example, in football, like I say, we lost uh, uh, the elite eight of the city championships. We probably took three weeks, two, three weeks off, right going to, after Thanksgiving break. We opened our weight room. It wasn't mandatory, but we opened our weight room. If you're free and you're not playing basketball, you're not joining indoor track, just know the option is here for you to get it. It was, you know, we had open weight room. You know, then going into January, we asked our players to give us three days a week. You know, we, we are, we're there Monday through Thursday. We actually to give us three days a week, along with any other sports in the offseason, whether it's baseball, volleyball. We all try to work together as one family at Western House. I mean, people think Western House, oh, it's, it's beautiful school, beautiful, but, you know, we, we share, we have a lot of varsity sports and we don't have a lot of space. We have little space to share. You know, for example, football, people think, oh, they got that beautiful field over there at Western House. Yeah, but we also have a girls flag, a girls flag football team. We also have a varsity and sophomore soccer team. We have a JV and varsity football team. We also got boys cross country and girls cross country. You know, so there's a million things going on 
on that little hundred yard space. We're not one of those schools that's blessed to have two other acres of space that we can just branch off at. And not to mention that if the soccer team has a game, my football team, we can't practice the full time. You know, we had to cut our practice short. So it's a lot of adversity that the coaches at West House go through. But I think, you know, we do a good job of, you know, making it work. You know, our athletic director does a good job of trying to put the schedule out early so everyone's on the same page. So there's no, you know, every now and then, of course, you know, something's going to change with Chicago public schools as far as, you know, bus issues or reference issues. We might start early, we might start later. But like I say, I think we do a good job at West House just working together as one family all the coaches to get that done and do what's best for our athletes. And then, I mean, we move on. I mean, with football, we just try to get to, I mean, we, we have, like, I'm going to give you an example. I just came back in the weight room last week, two weeks after I had surgery. I had 17 players in the weight room with coaches. I had eight players at baseball practice. Still had 10 players playing basketball. And I got another 14, 15 guys running track. So I know between that, I know all my guys are working. And I know it's still some guys that's just going to blow you off. You know, it's their kids, they're teenagers. You know, oh, I got a job. But their job is to really just go home and play Xbox, you know. Are they just, you know, and some of them truly do have a job. But, you know, we all been coaching a long time. You know, you're going to get those few kids that's going to blow you off. You know, so, I mean, but it makes me feel good to know that, hey, I just ended a varsity sport, but I know I got at least 35 to 45 guys putting in work in the offseason to be better. So we can hit that field come June for our 25 days. We're ready to run. Girls basketball, we just ended in the playoffs. Usually try to get them a few weeks off. You know, we uh, we only have one gym at West House, so we have to work around that. Me and the boys coach, you know, we work well together, trying to put together open gym schedule, different things that we could try to work with the girls through the summer and everything, and we make it work. But a lot of our girls play different AAU sports, so that's great because that keeps them active in the off season. Then in the summer, you know, we do our contact days. We try to get them maybe one or two tournaments. Fall league works sometimes because it's always on Sundays. And like I say, with my sisters and myself, we usually make that work as well. That's awesome. So I want to transition a little bit now just to your your coaching journey, right? Your your, your path up to this point. Um, when you were starting as, as as a young coach, right? You decided, hey, I want to coach. I, you get into it. Maybe you get an opportunity to, to start getting into it. Um, you know, I guess when did it, kind of click for you that you wanted to be a head coach right you're like this is something I really want to do and then once you decide that how do you go about preparing to be a head coach right we all know like you're an assistant right everybody kind of likes you right because you're the assistant right and then you move over those couple seats and it's a whole different world right it's a whole it's a whole different it's a whole different world so Maybe some people you you learn from your mentors, um, you, you know things you did on your own, um, you know, and then you know as you're going along, uh, how do you put all those ideas you get into making your own program and things you want to do? I mean, so for me, it was kind of. I mean, it was easy for me. Like uh, when I was in college, you know, uh, my summer job was a lifeguard for the Chicago Park District, so I was like, uh, I also taught like a junior lifeguard program swimming. And I volunteered with a, a high school friend of mine's father ran a youth football program at the park where I worked. So in the summers, I would volunteer and just work there. And it was like, it just hit me like, man, I think this is what I want to do. And I, you know, just any kid say that because they love doing it. They don't really, you know, I'm 17, 16. I don't realize the grind and what it's going to, I mean, you know, what it's going to entail as I get older. But I would say around my senior year of college, you know, I did it again that summer. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. I, I just made up in my mind, this is what I wanted. I was telling my parents. And they was like, well, go for it. And uh, uh, when I, I, I kept in contact with my old teachers, you know, from a grammar school I went to, it eventually became a high school called Douglas on the west side, Frederick Douglas Academy. Uh, one of my mentors was Mr. Douglas Key and James Mirable. Those two guys kind of, I kept in touch with them throughout my college year. And when I graduated, they gave me an opportunity. They were starting a football team, fresh varsity football team. Uh, another friend of mine, DeHavis Barnett, uh, and they kind of just, hey, why don't you come and help us out? And I did it that first year, man. When I tell you I had a ball and like, like I said, I wasn't in that seat where I had to be the bad guy. I loved it. So from there, I transitioned to helping them. Then I volunteered with another uh, local youth program, BBC Sports and the Garfield Park Gators. I became a head coach of my own seventh and eighth grade team. And that's when it really started. Like, I just kept work, working and working. And eventually at Douglas, uh, 
Mr. Key made me the head coach four years down the line, and it was like, it was tough. You know, we took some lumps, especially we were a small 1A school. You know, it was hard to get the kids to commit. You know, you instead of having 20 kids committed, you got eight or nine. So as, as a coach, you know, I had to fight through that adversity. Like, hey, yeah, I could be upset, but I, I still got eight or nine kids here. Let me work with these eight or nine kids to make them become better football players. And eventually it just worked for us. And, I mean, we had a lot of success at Douglas. We made two state playoff appearances. And that's great considering what we had to work with at Douglas. We had to walk a half a mile to practice. You know, we had to share equipment with other schools sometimes. It was just a lot of adversity we went to. And that led me to Western House. And at Western House, I mean, it's definitely much better. But, I mean, it's still we still fight through that same thing, you know. You know, it might be a week we play Phillips, and I might be able to use the field for two days. So now I'm in there watching film study, lifting weights, trying to figure out how can I make my team better of only having two days of practice. So that, that leads perfectly into your coaching now at your alma mater, um, which I'm sure brings its own awesomeness and its own challenges. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, just a couple parts on this question. It, it, first, for you, why was it important for you to return? Maybe what are some challenges you have coaching at your alma mater? And maybe what's one or two things that you want young people to know that maybe you wish you would have known when you were at Westinghouse? I mean, first off, the coach of my alma mater, man, I mean, it feels great. It's like, you know, I still remember when I first was interviewing and just, you know, because I was, I was, to be honest with you, I was happy at Douglas, but uh, the former coach at Westinghouse, he's a good friend of mine, uh, C. Kim Turner. He's actually the head coach at Kenwood now, and they're doing phenomenal things out there. He called me and was like, hey, I'm probably going to be taking another job. You know, he always tried to get me to coach with him or whatever because he knew I'm a Westinghouse alum. He's like, man, you really should put in for it. And uh, I thought about it, talked to the wife, and I was like, you know what? It would be nice to go back home, you know, put back on the green and gold. And I met with the AD several times, uh, Chris Washington. Uh, we built the relationship. And uh, eventually I got the job. And it was just, you know, it was like it felt great to be coaching back, you know, and giving back to where I, where I really, you know, got my start, you know. Why well, I learned to love the game of football. So it felt great to just be back there coaching. And, you know, basketball was just a plus. I mean, I was coaching basketball at Douglas, but, you know, we had a situation at Westinghouse where, you know, a coach had a family issue, kind of had to step away. And it was like, I built a relationship with those athletes. Because like I say, we're all one big family at Westinghouse. And uh, those girls needed a coach. And I was like, hey, you know what? I'll step up. What you need me to do? And it's kind of been a double duty for the last five years. <laughs> And every now and then, like I say, you know, you get a, a few men. I just need a meal today. But, you know, I love what I do. I love working with those young men and women, you know, and I appreciate the effort that they do give me, you know. So I wanted to get a little uh, offense, defense here, but I wanted to take it from the idea of what we what you can use from maybe football to help you basketball, right? I, I use the example like a, like a, like a rub route, right? And in football, kind of like a blur screen in basketball, right? Same, same type of same type of concept. So is there a crossover, maybe in some offensives and defensives concepts, terminology that you can use from football to take to basketball and maybe basketball to take the football to kind of even help your players maybe put it get the get the concept as well? And maybe is there I still think, I mean, I think I, yeah, I think I spoke on it earlier. The biggest thing for me is like whether it's, whether it's football or basketball, once I establish what you're going to give me, I like to put the ball in the best playmaker, in the best player's hands at times. You know, that's what I like to do. You know, I believe in that. I mean, you know, I believe, you know, yeah, football is one off the defensive side, you know, championships win, you know, games, but you still got to score. So my thing is in both sports with the similarities, I like to try to do my best to try to make sure my, the ball is always in the playmaker's hands especially in key moments of clutch situations of the game. You know, like I say, the football, I was blessed to have one of the best quarterbacks in the city, and I'm glad he's coming back. You know, he was only a junior. I feel good going into a game where it's close. Uh, if even if we up and I need somebody to control the floor of this game, I trust a ski to handle the game and make sure it gets done so we come out successful. You know, in basketball, I happen to have two guards. I have LaMonica Bryant and Jamila Jackson. When it gets close, you know, we're trying to stall it out of whether we need a bucket. Those two know that I'm looking at them to go get a bucket. If we need to stop, hey, let's, hey, we gotta, hey, meet them at half. Let's go. Who you got, you know? Who you got, you know? They know I'm dependent on. We got to have that, that mental toughness to go get it. 
So I think that's where the similarities come from. Me, I just want playmakers. Go be so a playmaker. Go be a ball player. So this is a, a this is a great add on to that. Then is when you're you kind of developing a system of communication. You know, football obviously it's a little different. You know, you can kind of talk in between the plays a little bit and. And I, you know, I've, I've seen you guys playing basketball. I know it's, it's a lot of flow, but you know, how do you kind of develop those, those different um, like forms of communication and terminology? Do you have maybe some similar terminology between the two sports? Is it completely different? I mean, it's different. Cause I mean, we, of course the terminology is totally different. You know, in football, we might use like, uh, what could I say? Uh, without sounding crazy, I give it myself away too much. You never know. Uh, Football, we might use a lot of animals, you know. Like, hey, we're an eagle. Check eagle, check eagle, check. Basketball, we usually just, you know, we just calling it out sometimes. I mean, we all smart coaching at the varsity level. So I could say, I could call it uh, Batman, Batman, but you're clearly going to see that I'm in a 2-3. You know what I mean? So it's a little different when it comes to basketball, you know. So I just let them know, hey, we're in two, we're in two. Step up, meet them at half. You know, and I'm a loud guy. You heard me coach. So I'm very, I think sometimes I'm the loudest guy in the gym, you know. So, I mean, if you don't hear me, that means you just ignoring me. And that's the problem. I need to get you out till you ready to listen to me. And I think you saw me do that a few times in the sectional game with the best player. Hey, you know what? Let me know when you're ready to play again. Because we're trying to do this and you're doing this. That was one of my favorite moments, Todd. He literally <laughs> looked at and just said, tell me when you're good. And just walked. I mean, I mean, because I mean, you're you're not going to help me if you're if you're upset about a call Correct. that happened five possessions ago. Yep. You're not helping me nor the team. Yep. Yeah, the whole gym saw you got fouled. But instead of you're instead of you moving on, let's trying to get another bucket, you're dwelling on that. It's talking to the ref or upset or mentally not in the game. Hey, come over here and sit down. Let me know when you're ready to play. You know, because it's hurting me more than it's helping me. Your skill level is too high for you to be pouting about that, you know. All right. So I wanted to again, this is something John and I talk about this all the time, but I, I think it'd be interesting for you. Um uh, Play, playoff formats, right? In football, you got to get to a certain certain level to get in. Right? I thought that's it's that's yeah. tough, man. That's that's really tough, especially with the schedule you play, right? Um, yes. In basketball, you know, kind of everybody everybody gets in, but then at the same time, you look. Some teams just don't aren't showing up that day. They're not, they're like, oh, I'm playing the one seed. I'm gonna get my doors blown off. I'm not I'm not gonna show for for whatever reason. So I'm not saying maybe basketball has to go to similar to football, but is there something we can do, I guess, both ways, right? Because there's a lot of regional things in, in football. There's a lot of regional things in, in basketball. Can we can we tweak it to make it to make it a better a better system for everyone? So some people might take this the wrong way, but I'm gonna give you my, my opinion on it. Football, I can't wait. That's so I coach asking. both sports. We know that right now. We know that in football. I, I think it's a pride thing. I feel like in football, it's something to work for. You can start, I'm going to give you an example. Coach Racky at Nazareth, they started the season one and four. But his team was mentally tough enough to fight back playing in that tough Chicago Catholic League schedule and not only fight back to make a playoff, but fight back to win a state championship. You know what I mean? In fo with football, you got you to gotta show you're the best. We're broke down into eight classes, not four like basketball. And in football, only the top 32 teams in that class makes the playoffs. So that means, you know, that's an accomplishment within itself. You know, I mean, I, I and I and I coach both sports. So I don't want to sound like I'm being a, a a bias towards one or the other because I definitely love doing both. But it is what it is. In football, you have to earn your way to compete for a state championship. And basketball, shit, I told you myself, my team started off three and seven. We were struggling, but guess what? Because of the basketball format, we were able to still get in the regional, still based on our strength of schedule, be a top five regional, be a top five in our sectional, and could get a chance to compete, win that first regional game, and compete for a regional championship. Hell, if this was football, we would have been at home that first week in February. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just being, I just think of football, the playoff system just gives you a little bit more like, I don't know, I don't want to say like, I mean, well, I say respect, like, hey, you got to respect the fact that this team from the west side of Chicago playing in one of the toughest conferences in the public league made the state playoffs. And they didn't make it at a 1A or 2A. They made it at a 5A level. And, you know, they competed, you know what I mean, at the highest level in football. There's 70 other teams in each class that can't say that. 
So it's a little different. But in basketball, it's all about how you finish. You know what I mean? I'm just being honest with you. I mean, we have some teams that play killer schedules. You know, Coach Cole at Amundsen plays a killer schedule every year. Killer schedule. So you might look at his record and be like, oh, but I wouldn't want to play them come February. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, use West House, for example. We were, I mean, shit, at one point in time, we were 4 and 10. Mm -hmm. People, but, you know, people are like, how are they 4 and 10? They have one of the best guards in the state. Well, you know, she's a sophomore. She just turned 15 and she's has a lot of maturing to do, but I bet you don't want to play us now come February, you know, and we got it together. I mean, I think me and you had a conversation about a coach. We did. We were at the Lane Tech shootout. You was like, we I wouldn't want to play you guys now, you know? That's what I said. So it's I, like, I mean, I, that's my opinion on it. Like, would I want to change anything? No. Leave it the same. In football, let those kids know, like, hey, when you make the state playoffs, you get a chance. You you get a chance to know that at the end of the day, you are a state qualified for the IHSA. You earned that. Mm -hmm. You know, no disrespect to basketball, but you know at the end of the day, if you have a shaky season, but you know the talent is there, you just get those kids to buy in at the right time. You can make a run. Yep. You can make a real run. <laughs> Todd and I couldn't agree more with everything you just you know? said. Um, I mean, I can give you another team in basketball. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, go uh, ahead. For example, uh, we played Chicago Hope. Yep. 1A. We both were struggling at the time. Last I checked, Chicago Hope was struggling or had a great year. They beat Chicago Hope early in the year. Last I checked, Chicago Hope was the one playing for the Super Sectional Championship. Yep. Not any of those other 1A City teams. Mm -hmm. So it's all about getting the kids to buy in at the right time. And that's a testament to that coach over there. It is. And especially in his first year. Um, so we want to, in our last two segments, the first one we call 30 second timeout. Um, it's your chance. You can talk about whatever topic you want. You can talk about yourself, your family, your programs, Westinghouse, um, something you want our listeners to know about. Um, we have, we have people turn the, the tables and ask Todd and I a question um, so it's it's kind of your 30 seconds in our show to to kind of lead the lead the floor. Man, uh I thought about this kind of tough, but uh I mean I definitely want to show my West House family some love because I mean I think you know all the coaches from West House, you know, I'd be all day trying to name them all, but you know, of course, all my sisters, you know, in football, my sister Reese Butler, my sister Ian Coach, phenomenal young coach. Does a great job of handling things. If I need to miss a day, because my son, you know, it's been games this year where my son plays at 11, we play at 1.30. I don't have to worry about trying to come to West House and then leave and come back, because I know my coaches are going to handle it. So I can get there at 12.30 right after this game, and my team is locked in, ready to roll. You know, same thing with basketball, you know. All my sisters do a great job. Uh, and all the coaches, the head coaches work well together, you know, from the track coaches to the basketball coaches to the volleyball coaches. We all do a good job of working together to make sure we get the best out of our athletes. And even with our small, with our shared space issues that we do have. Every now and then it gets a little frustrated, but at the end of the day, we all have the best intentions of making it, making everything work for our athletes. And that's what it's all about. All right, I want to move into uh, quick hitters, just kind of rapid fire questions here. Could be about pretty much anything. That's kind of how we, kind of how we roll. So uh, your first one here, favorite underknown place for you to get food in the city? Man, there's so many different places, man, but it, it ain't even no unknown place, but I'm a big pizza guy, man. I love Lou Manati's deep dish. Okay. People always talk about Gino's and, you know, Giordano. I'm a Lou Manati's guy, so I, I know that's not an underground spot, but that's my go-to spot. You know, I love Lou Manati's pizza. All right, favorite football team. This could be college, pro, high, high school, whatever. Favorite football pro uh, team of all time. Oh, man, I'm a big man. I'm a big Ohio State fan, man. Like, I'm a Buckeye fan, hard and hard. Like, I go to the coaches' clinic every year. I try to, I mean, depending on our schedule and basketball and football, if I can sneak down for a game, I'm a big Buckeye fan. My son plays football and wrestle, and, like, you know, I say, hey, son, if we get to that level, there's no point where you you know where you're going to I mean, I'm, I'm a big Ohio State fan. Oh man, I'm a Miami guy, so I still I'm still bitter that he stole that kit national championship. Oh no, nah, man, call. <laughs> we didn't steal that, and that was that was football. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, your favorite gear to coach in? What are you going? What's your gear when you go when you go coach? Obviously, man, believe it or not, man, when I first when I first started at West House in basketball, because I was uh, working at a different school, I was an administrative type. Not you know, I was on the administrative type team. I was always in a shirt and tie, but I would be so uncomfortable, man. So now, man, I'm a I'm a kind of like polo guy, man. Like polo, 
jeans or slacks, you know, comfortable shoes. Football, I used to, I used to be a big heavy khaki guy. Just <laughs> I don't know, I was old school. The, the kids always tell me, man, you were old school. You're too young for that. Right. Now I'm kind of just like, hey, man, jog, jogger pants and dry fit. Hoodie, something yeah. comfortable. But you I used to be, go to football. Gotta be warm during, to be, gotta be warm during man, football season, too. Football, I used to be a big khaki shirt tucked in, you know, kind of like Jim Trestle sweater fest guy. Okay. But now I'm kind of like, hey, man, let's throw the jogger pants on. Let's, hey, I'm big on owning my brand. Like, hey, anytime I know I'm doing some West House, whether I'm coaching, I'm going to the event representing West House, I want to make sure I got something on with West House. I want people to know, hey, that's a guy from West House. I want to own my brand. You never know who you're going to run into. You know what I mean? So I'm big on that. But as far as dress, kind of basketball, I'm a polo guy. You know, just khakis and slacks, some comfortable shoes, football, even more relaxed jogging pants and some type of pullover hoodie or something. All right, so we're we're gonna do this, but I'm gonna say your favorite Chicago Bull of all time, but it can't be Jordan, and then your favorite Chicago Bear. Uh, that's easy for me. I mean, my favorite Bull would be uh, Scotty Pippen. Okay. Scotty Pippen. I mean, people. Are, I mean, Jordan was a killer, but Scotty Pippen had that killer instinct too. And Scotty mm-hmm. Pippen was also one of the best defenders of all time. You know, Jordan doesn't win six rings without Scotty, True. and vice versa. You know, Scotty was a killer. He was a he was one of those on the court, like he said, he'll go get it when it's time to go get it. So that was kind of easy for me. And favorite Bell, people always say, you know, oh, Walter Payton, no disrespect, Walter Payton is definitely a GOAT. But for me, Michael Singletary was probably, man, he was a phenomenal, just that I, them, you know, he. I tell my kids, you know, my kids laugh at me because we try to show them old clips sometimes. We do stuff on Fridays before the game. We got to show them like, hey, man, this is Reggie. They look at me like, who are those guys, you know? <laughs> But we showed him a clip of Mike Singletary, how he was just, you know, you watch the NFL uh, network or whatever. They do the little old videos. Mike Singletary had that look in his eyes to let you know, like, hey, I'm coming down here every play. So you better bring your A game, you know. That's what, I mean, that's why, that's my favorite band, Michael Singletary. He was just a, he was just a phenomenal linebacker. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, your favorite hoop and shoe. Where, where it was back in the day, whether it's now, whether whatever it may be, what was your what favorite gym? I mean, people laugh at me, man, but I don't know if y'all remember, man. It was people used to walk in that old Western House gym. You know, I'm a Western House alum, man. You walk in that old gym coming down them stairs on Franklin, man. You walk in there with the uh, sodium lights. You see all those banners in there. That that took the you know some people used to turn around when they walked in that gym back in the day. When I played, when uh when I was a student at West House, you know, when Chris Hill was the coach. Yeah. Coach uh, Quentin Dillon, you know, Henry Cotton, who and those guys were coaching there when I was at West House. You walk down those stairs, you had to walk down those long stairs to get in the gym with those yellow sodium lights. And you saw those banners, you knew you were in for a fight. You knew you were going to get a game. So that was my favorite gym to watch a game at. All right. So we got, you, you, so the Bears obviously made that big trade recently. You know, you're a football guy. What's your thoughts on the trade? A lot of people might be upset, Thomas, and they hate that they dropped so far down and now, but I'm going to tell you something. It, it, that, that trade did a few things for me. One, it showed that despite all the rumors you hear about them fully not having faith in Justin Fields, it showed them right there, hey, Justin, now if this don't show you we riding with you right now, I don't know what does. We They, they showed that they had a the confidence that Justin Fields can get them to where they want to go. And then, believe it or not, I mean, I just personally think they're falling to Jacksonville Jaguars. You know, you build your team with draft picks. Young and hungry players is fighting. And that's what they're going to do. They're set for the next couple of years. I mean, they're going to have probably almost over, what, 15 picks within the next two to three years as of right now. And that's how you build a team when you have, you know, when you have a young team you're trying to build. You build within a draft. All right, this so one's a little – Oh, go ahead. This one's a little bit more, uh, I guess, maybe could be controversial. It usually turns into a city, Chicago versus uh, – north versus south thing. But – um you know, there's been a lot of changes to the state championship format, whether it be location, whether it be, you know, now the third place games they play right after. Um, you know, uh, there's probably going to be someone upset about it, no matter what you do. But, um, you know, what, what do you kind of think on the state championship format, the locations, where where to put them? You know, and I think it comes in maybe more, especially in the in the higher classes too, right? Where majority of the bigger schools are up, especially basketball, right? I'm talking basketball more here, right. um, mm-hmm. or are, are up north. Right. What what is this something maybe we can look at? Is there something we can do or do you like it the way it is? Me personally, I mean, I'm a first of all, I'm gonna say this like 
I don't think you're ever going to please everybody. You know, no matter where the location is, it's always going to be somebody upset. But believe it or not, I've I've been I've never made it there yet. We're going to make it though, not yet. But I don't think you're ever going to please everybody. First off, because if you go somewhere, say if you go to to Evanston or Northwestern, you're not going to please all the one day schools that's coming from the far south or whatever. If you go, so no one's ever going to be happy. I mean, I personally think being at U of I is a good spot. You know, for the boys and Illinois State is always done right by the girls. So I think it's you know. I think the, the playoff format is fine. People complain about it being, oh, well, if you if you lose, you got to play back to back on that Thursday or that Friday, whether it be. But people don't realize several years ago, before they made the switch, they would let eight teams go down state, and if you lost that Friday night, you were one and done. So basically, you went down there to play one game, right? And if you lost on that Saturday morning, both teams played back to back, you know, in that final four, you know. So I mean, you're never going to please everybody. All right, so we got – so Todd and I are big shoe guys. So your, what's your favorite shoe? Either you're, you're just chilling in it or you're, you're hooping in it or you're coaching in it. What's your favorite shoes? My favorite shoes to coach in for basketball, I like to wear Jordan 1s, man. I'm a big Jordan 1 guy. And I, if I'm on the casual side, I like to wear Kohans. They're comfortable. I'm a big guy, so I need something to be comfortable in the case when I'm moving and stumping around and hollering. For football, I'm all man. I'm I'm all about comfort, cause I'm walking them sidelines, and so I mean any type of uh you know just Nike cross trainer shoe would be comfortable for me. Some comfort, cause I mean football is a long game. You're pacing the sidelines, so you just need some comfort. But basketball, I'm a big Jordan one, and like I like to I'm casual. I like to wear Kohans. Coach Carter. Uh, thank you for being on with us today. This Todd and I had a lot of fun. I knew this would be a fun episode. I knew this would be an episode that's unique because you are a varsity uh, head coach of two sports. So thanks for jumping on with us today and, and sharing your story with our listeners. Man, I appreciate you guys having me, and it was great. I had a ball doing this. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast in concert with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association. Please remember to give us a five-star rating wherever you may listen. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout and subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening. Uh, this episode of the After the Timeout podcast in partnership with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association, we welcome Julius Carter, head girls basketball coach and head football coach at Westinghouse High School. We talked to Coach Carter about coaching multiple sports, coaching in the Chicago Public League, helping athletes grow, and much, much more. As always, thank you for listening to the After the Timeout podcast.